So, um, until now we have uh, described the previous lectures, we have described how to deal with fermions. We've seen how to deal with them in a path integral formalism and in the operator formalism. And today we're going to uh, finish up uh, the discussion of the fermions with uh, a bunch of uh, technical points. <coughs> Specifically, the first one is how to do sums over spin, which, are something that, which is something that um, is very useful in um, experiments. Uh, that is to say, usually one does not measure spin, and then um, in order to, to check against the experiment, you have to do some sums of a spin, which turn out to simplify our life a lot. Um, then uh, I will uh, describe for you various bilinears um, made out of uh, Dirac spinners and how they transform and all their properties. And then we'll describe the symmetries, the standard symmetries of C, P, T, which are conjugation, parity, and time reversal invariants, as they uh, pertain to uh, fermions, since they, there are some particularities for fermions. All right, so first, let's talk about spin sums. As I said, the basic idea is that um, we don't measure the, the spin, or, I mean, that is to say, the polarization, the spin projection of um, of particles, usually in experiments. I mean, one could, but it's uh, in most experiments we don't. And so, uh, a useful thing to do is to try to see what happens if we sum the spin, and as we'll see. Um, the calculations become somewhat easier. So um, there are basically two formulas that we need to consider. The point is that, um, as we saw uh, before, there are two two types of solutions to the uh, to the Dirac equation. There's one that's given in terms of uh, us of p, which correspond to positive uh, frequencies, and one corresponding to vs of p, corresponding to negative frequencies, where s stands for spin. So the point is to sum over this s, spin, in the case of either positive or negative frequencies. And I, as I also said, any observable um, cannot be fermionic. You cannot observe for Lorentz invariance. You cannot observe uh, fermionic index. So that means that um, the only things that will appear in observables are bilinear invariants. Bilinear in either u or v. And uh, so. Turns out then that um, that the one thing that we need to consider, which will appear in uh, in S matrices as we'll see later on, is this particular bilinear. Now the point being that so if the only thing that I would um, so if I if I would calculate an actual uh, Lorentz invariant, then I should have put u bar u. That's Lorentz invariant. But u u bar instead is going to be a matrix. So this would be something that would be inserted inside um, a bigger uh, expression. So it will be a matrix inserted between other matrices. And we want to see what this matrix corresponds to. So. The sum is over S from 1 to 2, spin up and spin down. So sum over S, and we've wrote uh, specifically, we, we wrote the solution for this US of P. So this was 
square root minus p dot sigma psi s square root minus p dot sigma bar psi s where I remind you psi s corresponds to 1, 0 or 0, 1 so this would be let's say for s equal 1 this would be s equal to 2 this is the constant matrix and now you bar s um, which corresponds to um, psi s dagger square root minus p dot sigma uh, minus p dot sigma bar psi s dagger square root minus p dot sigma uh, so u bar <coughs> is u dagger times uh, i gamma zero and i gamma zero uh, switches the order of these things All right, so this is a matrix. Let's uh, write its components. Right, so uh, first of all, so psi s is this, and um, psi s dagger then would be, I mean, this is real, so it's just a com uh, the transpose, right? So, um, so psi s uh, times psi s dagger, right, gives um, just a matrix. So psi s psi s dagger is just one zero 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 here and here zero 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 one, right? Uh, <coughs> Um, right. Uh, mm, something is not quite right. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, that I, I forgot the main the main point. Yes. So the point was that I had sum over s equal to one and two, which I can of, of course put in the middle here. So uh, I said that psi s psi s dagger was equal to this or this, right? But now if I put sum over s equal to one or two. Then I get the sum of these two things, which is just the identity, right? So the sum over s of psi s psi s dagger is 1. And as you see, the psi s psi s dagger appears in the middle. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so that amounts to, in the middle in between two other matrices, so that, that amounts to just removing this size, size dagger, since when I take the sum, I get just the identity. So then in the product, we'll get square root minus p dot sigma times square root <coughs> minus p dot sigma bar. That's one one component. Then, um, I write it down to the left to have space. Um, and then this times this is square root minus p dot sigma square root minus p dot sigma and then square root minus p dot sigma bar square root minus p dot sigma bar and finally square root minus p dot sigma bar square root minus p dot sigma okay that's uh, the matrix, <coughs> um, and uh, and then let's. So this is the product of two square roots, but as usual, this means the square root of the product, even for matrices, right? 
because of multiplication of matrices. Now here, and here we have the same matrix, so square root of the same matrix squared, that is the matrix itself. So this is minus b dot sigma. This is minus b dot sigma bar. Right? <clears throat> so it remains to calculate this. So here I have um, p dot sigma times p dot sigma bar. Okay? So let's see that. So p dot sigma times p dot sigma bar. Uh, so this is p mu p mu sigma mu sigma bar mu. But as before, we see we notice that this is symmetric in mu nu. That is, this is also symmetric in mu nu. Right? <clears throat> um, so uh, I can write this, let's say, as one half the anticommutator. And then um, I remember that sigma i sigma j is delta i j plus i epsilon i j k sigma k. Right? This is the general relate product of uh, Pauli matrices, which means that sigma i sigma j um, anticommutator, or an anticommutator, this goes away, this is antisymmetric, okay, 2 delta i j, right? Um, and, uh, and then sigma mu is 1 times sigma i, so 1 and sigma i, and sigma bar mu is 1 and minus sigma i, right? <clears throat> um, uh, I seem to have some... Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no. That, yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I I have this, but then I also uh, the thing that I want is sigma mu and sigma uh, anticommutator with sigma bar. So then I can put a minus sign on both, right? And then this would be sigma bar j, right? Um, and now I want to, and I also have. Sigma zero, sigma zero. So that's the identity. Um, this is two, right? So all in all, I have that sigma mu, sigma bar mu, anticommutator is minus two eta mu, right? It's plus on the time component, zero component, and uh, minus on the spatial component. Okay, so this thing is minus eta mu. So this is then minus p squared, p mu p mu times minus eta mu, minus p squared. So on shell, which is what I mean when I write u of p and v of p, I mean the solutions of the Dirac equation, which are on shell. And on shell minus p squared is equal to m squared. Right? Okay. <coughs> um, so uh, now, sorry. Uh, I, I just forget uh, when the when I have uh, on the anti-commutator of the sigma matrices when I have, for example, mu mu equals one and and, and mu. Uh, mu, mu zero and mu one, for example, I, I'd have uh, the anticommutator uh, of of the identity with with a sigma matrix, right? Right. And and it, uh. it, it isn't zero, right? Uh. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, I have one time sigma i. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, that's, excuse me, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's the point, that this is, uh, um, this is, what I mean by this is one half uh, sigma mu sigma bar mu plus sigma mu sigma bar mu, right? And then it cancels. And then it cancels. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Right. It's, uh, yeah, it's not... Yeah, it's not quite the end commutative, right? The point is this is uh, symmetrization. Okay, yeah, right. So yeah, maybe I should have put it, yeah, I should put it like this, I guess. This is then minus i p slash p mu gamma mu plus m times 1. So let's write that here. So finally we arrive at us, sum, sum over s us of p, p bar s of p minus i p slash plus m. And similarly, I can prove, I mean, you can do it yourself, that. The other one with the v's uh, gives um, minus m. So p s of p, p bar s of p minus i p slash minus m. Okay. So uh, this will be useful later on because when we will write uh, amplitudes as matrices, as matrices, we will find um, products of gamma matrices, in fact, things like this, p slash, things like p slash, and um, and then when we take the sum of, but normally we should have the u's and u bars, but when we take the sum, we replace those as well with uh, p slash. So we, we reduce the calculation of uh, um, of amplitudes to uh, gamma matrix calculation, right? which is long, but it's very algorithmic. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, now, fermion bilinears. So, this is the next technical point fermion bilinears. Um, again, the same reason. As I said, there, there are no uh, single fermions because of Lorentz invariance, you cannot observe a Lorentz index. 
So uh, the results that we'll have uh, will be written in terms of um, things that are bilinear in fermions. So that means that we have to understand what possible bilinears can we have and what are their transformation properties. So uh, to psi gives us associated psi bar. And as I said, the, the reason to associate psi bar was such that psi bar psi is a Lorentz scalar. So that was, we defined psi bars in such a way. Psi diagonal sum times some data, which was found such that this is found this up to phase i gamma zero. My choice was to write it like this. Um, so that means this is in the spin one half, and this is in a con conjugate representation of the Lorentz group. <coughs> um, now, what about its transformation property? Well, this being in the spin one half and one half bar representations of the Lorentz group means that under a Lorentz transformation, which uh, rotates the indices of x, the uh, corresponding action on psi is with a matrix, but now with spin ordered indices, right? So psi, psi, psi prime alpha is some S alpha beta that depends on this lambda. It's related to this lambda times psi beta. This is our transformation. And of course, psi bar transforms with S minus 1. <coughs> Okay. Um, all right. But now let's go on to other kind of uh, bilinears. So, you know, psi transpose is um, a row vector, and psi is a column vector. So, other Lorentz invariants, which means in particular they have to be numbers, not matrices. Um, are obtained by inserting some matrix in between. Right? And, well, the things that will appear are gamma matrices, since these are constant matrices. Perhaps multiplied by momentum, by which I mean to get things like phi slash. Okay, so the next thing that we can consider is psi bar. Let's say the first thing we can, just gamma. Gamma mu. Right? So that's that's one thing. And the point about this, we wrote gamma mu with an index mu, which is a Lorentz vector index. And that's not uh, incidental. That's a statement that this transforms like a Lorentz vector. Transforms like a Lorentz vector. But what does that mean? Because it also has. Uh, spin array indices, alpha and beta. So it means a combination of both, meaning, let's say, I write with indices gamma, uh, uh, gamma delta, so gamma mu alpha beta, let's say, transforms into um, um, so, or better yet, let's say, if I transform the indices, um, if I transform the indices alpha and beta with a spinner uh, matrix that is in this way, so S minus 1, uh, sorry, S uh, alpha gamma, S minus 1 um, delta beta. So transforming the spin order indices amounts to transforming the uh, vector index with lambda. Right? So if I transform, remember S and lambda are related. So if I transform the indices, the spin order indices, 
it's equivalent to transforming the um, vector indices. And that, of course, means since psi itself transforms with s, right? That if I from, if I do um, psi bar gamma mu psi, this uh, transforms as lambda mu psi bar gamma mu psi. Right. So the Lorentz transformation transforms the indices of alpha of, of the spinners, which in turn by this relation amounts to a transformation of the vector indices of the bilinear. Okay? All right. Okay. So, as I said, the bilinear we could construct are by inserting some 4 by 4. So, this is uh, 1 by 4 matrix, this is, uh, this is 4 by 1 matrix. So, by the, the most general bilinear would be would be psi bar m 4 by 4 psi, right? That would be the most general bilinear I could construct with m being some constant matrix. But a constant 4 by 4 matrix, so this is 4 by 4 means there are 16 components. So a constant 4 by 4 matrix can be decomposed into a basis of 16 matrices, 16 independent matrices. And since we already know four of them, gamma mu, we can in fact construct a basis out of these. Um, so the complete basis, so this complete basis formed from gamma mu is, well, one of course, and gamma mu, right? Then we know another one. As I've told you that I can multiply all the gammas and obtain a gamma five that moreover acted as a fifth gamma in five dimensions. So this is really an independent one by that very notion. Okay, so so far we have six matrices. We still need ten. Well, we can consider the product of gamma mu with gamma five. So that's another four matrices. We still need six, and uh, it's kind of obvious that the next thing we could try is to multiply two of these gammas by themselves, right? Different gammas, gamma mu and gamma mu. But if they are different, another way of saying it is one half times the commutator, which is denoted by gamma mu nu. <coughs> so gamma mu nu is by definition the antisymmetric product of uh, antisymmetric product of two gammas. <coughs> okay, so now we have 16 matrices, and we call this basis OI. So yeah. in our notes, we should have this one half. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 this is like this. Yeah, I, yeah, I put the uh, antisymmetric. I meant this. It, it has to be like a gamma matrix, right? So the antisymmetric product of two. Um, so the point is, in fact, the reason why I take, take this, uh, you, you want to have the same kind of normalization condition. So the normalization condition would be trace OI or J. And it's in fact, it has to be the same for all of them. And you can guess what by looking at this. If OI is 1, then I get trace of 1, which is 4. For delta i j, and uh, 
so for so this is obvious for one, and let's try also for gamma. So trace gamma mu gamma nu. Right? This is under the trace. Under the trace, I can change things cyclically, but there are only two, so that means I just change the order. So this is the same as um, as trace of one half times the commutator, right? Uh, the uh, the anti-commutator, excuse me, the symmetric. Um, and this, as we know, I mean this one half, the anti-commutator is just delta minimum, right? So this is again delta minimum trace of one, and this is four. Okay, you can similarly prove all of them if you want. Okay, so this basis is orthonormal. Now there are 16 matrices, so if they are independent, it's also complete. And um, well, you can sort of convince yourself that they are independent, therefore you can already write the completeness relation. So the completeness relation <coughs> right, so how would you write I mean the good way to remember is the Dirac Brian Kett notation, right? Alright, that's that's one way of writing it. Alright, so uh, if I want to write this in terms of these matches. So first of all, there's a sum over these things, and then uh, so sum of n and n. This is something like this, and then I have to decide. Um, I have to decide what uh, how I um, take the product, right? <coughs> well, specifically, what this means is, you see, these are. Um, um, we have something like this, right? A column vector in here, and, um, a row vector, equal to, and on the right hand side we have a matrix. So that means to say I don't need to, uh, I, I, I shouldn't sum over the indices, I should write independent indices. Let's say alpha, beta, gamma, delta, right? And then this should be identity, which means I should identify two by two the indices. So um, I put them specifically so that I have delta up and down, so delta alpha beta, delta gamma delta. Right. <clears throat> and uh, let's see why this is a completeness relation. I mean, this was just so you remember how to write a completeness relation, but now let's prove it. What does completeness mean? Well, completeness means that if I have an arbitrary matrix M, I should be able to use this to write it in terms of the basis elements O, right? So this has to be written in terms of O, right? So let's say this is, uh, as I call it, delta alpha, right? And I want to write it in terms of the matrices OI with the same indices delta alpha, right? Just that I is independent, so I, here I will have some, have some coefficient CI, right? But the point is that uh, the coefficient CI, by taking trace on both sides, if I take trace with OI on both sides, Um, that is to say, OI I multiply with OI delta alpha, right? That's taking trace with OI. I should obtain an identity, right? Using the completeness relation. So, in fact, here I'll get trace one half M OI. And let's check that I do get an identity by using the completeness relation. So if I get this, 
Here on the left hand side, I get trace MOI. And on the right, right hand side, we get one fourth trace MOI. So that part cancels. And then I get uh, um, I get the OI, yeah, OI, uh, no, trace OJ, sorry. <laughs> I should have traced with an arbitrary j, right? Trace m or j. And then here I get trace o i or j, which by the normalization condition is 4 delta i j. And now I get an identity, right? But uh, if I look at this, so let me write this. Uh, more precisely, it's one quarter m um, beta gamma. No, m uh, should say gamma beta times o i beta gamma. Right? That's the trace m o i. And now um, I see that I have one quarter. Oi beta gamma Oi delta alpha. Um, yeah, I should have put the one quarter, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, forgot, I forgot that. So, but the point is, I have now the same. The same thing as in here, right? I have one quarter Oi beta gamma Oi delta alpha. Which I know that this is just delta alpha beta delta gamma delta by the completeness relation, and when I substitute this in here, um, I get an identity. Right. So this is actually an, uh, a completeness relation. So this is a completeness relation, but its usefulness is by multiplying it with spinners. By multiplying it with some arbitrary spinners, we will get some useful identities that you have to know how to use very well, because if you ever start doing fermion amplitudes, you lose them to death. Um, so these are called Hertz identities. Okay, so these are just the completeness relation times some arbitrary fermions. Okay, so let's say, well, let me write the completeness relation. So one quarter. Oi beta gamma Oi um, uh, delta alpha. I said this was equal to delta alpha beta delta uh, gamma delta. Okay, and now let's multiply this. Um, let's multiply with. Uh, Chi beta, psi bar gamma, and n phi delta, where n is also some arbitrary name. So this is, I just put it in a form that is useful to remember afterwards, but the point is uh, this n times phi is another type of fermion, right? But I've written it in a, in a form that uh, Easier to identify afterwards. Okay. So if I multiply this on both sides, here I get what? So chi beta delta delta alpha. alpha. So I get chi alpha. Then psi bar gamma delta alpha gamma delta gamma delta. Sorry, times n phi delta. So this is psi bar n phi. 
right? Equal to, and now in here I have one quarter, OI beta gamma, so, but this is multiplied with psi gamma and chi beta. Just that, note the, the order. So remember these are fermions, so they are anti-commuting objects, they are Grassmann numbers, right? Here I put them in the right order, chi, beta, psi, and phi. But now I have to switch the order because to write the Lorentz invariant, I write psi bar stuff psi. So this is now minus psi bar O i chi, and then O i multiplied with n phi. So O i n phi with an index alpha. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, well, if I. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand what you did there. Where? Just insert the. So I just multiplied by this, right? Oh, this is expanding. not expanding. End. I just multiply I, I, this. Right. This times this. Oh. This relation times this, right? So I just wrote this thing here and this thing here, right? right. Said psi chi beta delta beta alpha is chi alpha, right? Psi bar gamma times uh, delta gamma delta, so psi bar delta, then n phi delta, so that's this, okay? And then here, I have one quarter, and I said yes. I have to switch the order of this, so psi bar O i chi with a minus, and then n phi and this, so O i n phi, right? Okay. And now, if I want, so the form I have in here, I also multiply this by another matrix. Okay. Just another form. Okay. And that's uh, the form that I most like most use. But this is one form. It's important to real realize that really. So this is the most common form of the field side that it is. But really, you have to remember that it's just the completeness relation multiplied by whatever fermions you want. So you can come up with other forms of field side identities just by taking the completeness relation and multiplying it by um, other um, by other fermions. And this is called also Fields recoupling because you see what happened. Here I have something with an index alpha, chi with an index alpha, but here I have the, the thing with phi with an index alpha, right? That's why it's called recoupling. I recoupled, so these were coupled here together, and that's chi had an index alpha, and he, now psi is, is coupled with chi, and phi has an index alpha. That's why it's called recoupling. Okay. Um, all right. So one of other observation was uh, that you could think you could think that uh, so so I have the, a basis with this one gamma mu gamma five gamma mu gamma five and gamma mu nu. and you might ask, well, is that enough? Won't, won't I obtain, if I keep multiplying these and taking anti-symmetric products so that they're not equal, don't I get something new? And the answer is no. Let's see why. Um, uh, 
<coughs> so first of all, uh, if I write a gamma with mu nu rho sigma, so gamma mu gamma mu gamma rho gamma sigma anti-symmetrized over these indices. In fact, um, this is proportional to epsilon in your sigma, which is just the, um, the Levi-Civita symbol, which is just plus or minus one, depending on um, the order of indices, times gamma 5. And so why is that? Well, because gamma 5 is by definition, um, well, uh, the sign was minus sign, yeah? gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, right? So minus i, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, right? And then remember that gamma mu, gamma mu is 0 if mu is different than mu. It means I have gamma mu gamma mu is minus gamma mu gamma mu if mu is different than mu. Right? And then here, this is anti and so they're all different. Right? Which means really, and there are only four gammas, which means really the gammas I have in here are just gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, but in some order. Right? In some random order, depending on which index is mu, uh, mu is which index is like one or something, right? Uh, so, but then I I just use this formula and I just switch them with minus signs, and the minus signs are such corresponding to the permutation of zero, one, two, three into the neural sigma. In other words, just the definition of epsilon neural sigma. And the proportionality constant, well, there's an i for sure because of this. And then there's a sign that you have to figure out. <clears throat> OK. Um, and then that means that also we have that gamma mu nu rho with three indices, which is the same, again, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma rho, anti-symmetrized. Um, this is actually also of this type. So the point is, <coughs> the point is, you know that uh, there are only four gammas, and then gamma mu, well, gamma i squared is plus one, gamma zero squared is minus one. Right? So, uh, <coughs> so if I put an extra gamma, it will square to one. Uh, so, in other words, you can, you can guess that if I multiply with another gamma in, in here, right, I will do this. I will have five gamma, so necessarily four of them will be different, but the fifth will be equal to one of them. And it will square to plus or minus one. So in the end, I will be left with only three. And they are all different, right? So that's of this type, gamma mu nu rho. And on the right hand side, I'll get gamma 5, epsilon gamma 5 times another gamma. So this is uh, proportional to epsilon mu nu rho sigma, gamma uh, sigma, gamma 5. Right? Again, the constant proportionality you can figure out. It's a sine times an i. Okay? Uh, All right. So, so there are no other gamma, right? Because one, once, so I, here I had that until four, uh, until two gammas. I've written that three is proportional to this, which are already gamma mu gamma phi are already in the basis, and four is proportional to gamma phi already in the basis. And if I take Gantz magic product of five, that's zero because well, there are only four indices. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Right. So then, coming back to our question about bilinear, so what, what do we have? Well, they, the, um, the transformation properties are given by the indices and about whether or not I have a gamma 5. Um, <coughs> so, psi bar gamma minus psi is a vector, right? Psi bar psi is a scalar. Psi bar gamma minus psi is a vector, we saw, it transformed as a vector. But then, we start saying like this, psi bar gamma 5 psi is a pseudo-scalar. Now the pseudo part means it transforms everywhere as a scalar, except when you consider parity. So parity transformation means exchanging the sign of spatial coordinates. So spatial x goes to minus spatial x, right? Um, and a scalar is also a scalar under parity, means it's invariant under parity, but pseudo scalar changes sign under parity. Okay. Uh, I, I will not write yet the transformation law because this is part of what I'll write later. Also today, but later. Um, let's continue with the possibilities. So uh, I have 1, gamma mu, gamma 5 in the middle. Next would be gamma mu, gamma 5. So, so this one would be what? What do I call this in terms of Lorentz properties? Pseudo vector. Pseudo vector, right? So it has gamma 5, which is transformed under parity, and then gamma mu transforms as a vector. So this is a pseudo vector. And then the next thing I have is psi bar gamma mu nu psi, which is some anti symmetric. <clears throat> All right, so these are the possible bilinears because, as we said, the bilinears are psi by matrix 4 by 4 times psi, and matrix 4 by 4 is always decomposable in this basis. All right, uh, let's make one more observation that is, strictly speaking, not connected with what I said, but it's a good point to make it. Uh, one defines the vector term psi bar gamma mu psi if psi satisfies the Dirac equation. Um, this is a vector current because, as we'll see, if let's say psi is an electron, this would be a source. Um, for a current. And then we might ask, if you remember conservation of a current, what is the mu j mu? If it, this is really a current, this should be zero. So let's see, if I take d mu on this thing, I can act either here or here. So this is d mu psi bar gamma mu psi plus psi bar gamma mu Right? Um, but then I have to remember that this satisfies um, the Dirac equation, which is gamma mu d mu plus m psi is zero. That is to say, this thing I replace with minus m psi. Right? Uh, and on the other hand, I also have seen that if I take the bar of this, I get the psi bar times minus d slash plus m is zero. 
In other words, uh, well, this way, <laughs> derivative acting on the, on the left. Which means that uh, this thing, so d mu psi bar gamma mu, is equal to plus m psi bar. So this thing is equal to plus m psi bar. And as you see, the two terms cancel. And this gives zero. This is indeed a conserved current. Um, on the other hand, we can also define the so-called axial vector current. Well, it's another definition for pseudo vector, axial vector. That is to say, j mu phi, that is psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi. And then, uh, by the same token, I have, if I put here gamma phi, now, um, In here, in the second term, this would not be anymore. This would only be equal to minus psi if I commute gamma phi away, right? Because I have gamma mu d mu psi is equal to minus psi. So now, in the second term, so d mu j, j uh, mu phi is equal to. In this first term, I get the same result. So I get plus m psi bar. Psi bar gamma phi psi, right? <clears throat> but in here, I have to anticommute gamma phi onto the other side of the gamma mu, so I can use this relation. So then I get a minus sign, so minus psi bar uh, gamma phi times this gamma mu d mu psi. And this was equal to minus m psi. But you see now the sign has changed, so this is plus 2m psi bar gamma phi psi. So that's different from 0. And it's only 0 if m equal to 0. Okay. So the vector current for an on-shell Dirac scale, uh, Dirac fermion, is, uh, is conserved, but the axial vector current is only conserved if the mass is zero. This is something to remember, because we'll use in lectures after that. <coughs> All right. So, C, P, and T. So P is parity, and as we said, parity means just exchanging the sign of the spatial coordinates, so it takes Tx into T and minus x. Right? On the other hand, T is time reversal, so that's the opposite. It changes just the sign of T, but leaves space unchanged. So these could be, uh, could be symmetries. Now, it used to be that people thought that these are sacrosanct, but then it was shown that they're not. So it's important to realize that this could be symmetries or not. So can be symmetries or not. It's not, it's a, it depends on the theory. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have uh, the charge conjugation, which we'll describe in more detail, but roughly speaking, it takes particles into antiparticles. So 
this is not a transformation of space-time, but rather an abstract transformation that takes particles into antiparticles. <coughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, there's a classification that is worth noting here. Um, So this is the Lorentz group with, um, um, with positive parts for transformation on under time and under space, but uh, with positive, so plus one for time transformations in plus one for determinant of lambda, let's say, which amounts to the same as, because of this amounts to the same as determinant of the, uh, determinant of the spatial part, spatial part of transformation. But except for this, the, the general Lorentz group, general Lorentz transformations, um, have the disconnected, so this is a, a connected piece. This is connected, that means to say um, continuous, there are continuous transformations, continuously connected to the identity. Okay, but besides this in the Lorentz group, there Three more disconnected par parts. Uh, so L minus up, L plus down, and L minus down. Um, uh, yeah. uh, and so this one, the one that we're most interested in, the connected piece of the identity is called the proper group and uh, uh, sorry uh, L plus part is called the proper group and L minus improper and L up is called orthochronous and L minus uh, non-orthochronous and then this would be proper orthochronous. That is, time flows uh, in a positive direction, and there are no parity transformations. Transformations have determinant one for space. And, uh, and so all of these pieces are obtained from the continuous piece by acting with this P and T. Right? So L minus let's say is P L plus and L down is P L up, right? All right. Good. Okay, so as I said, for the longest time, people thought that, uh, that all of these symmetries must be symmetries of physics, but it was proven experimentally that they are not. So what is cer certainly true is that gravitational, electromagnetic and strong, and strong interactions respect CPT. That is certainly true. On the other hand, weak interactions break C and P separately. But preserve CP. That is the product of the two. 
And for this discovery, there was the Nobel Prize um, awarded to it. It was a revolution in the thinking of uh, physicists who until then, because of this, they thought that C CMPT are fundamental, um, fundamental symmetries of nature. So, but until then, but, uh, if, I, if I say this, then it seems like, well, C and P are separately broken, but CP is not. So maybe CP is a symmetry. But in fact, no, there's, there's good experimental evidence for CP breaking, even in the standard model. Even in the standard model, and certainly beyond. So, in fact, yeah, well, let's leave it at this. The standard model there is uh, very small, extremely small CP breaking, but there is evidence that um, there's more. Um, at higher energies corresponding to the understandable model. However, there is a very general theorem general means that their assumptions are things that are, we still believe to be true like unitarity and locality Unitarity means quantum mechanics being valid, the sum of probabilities being one, and locality meaning that physics is, is, is always local. <clears throat> so this general theorem says that CPT is invariant, is an invariance. So the product of all three symmetries is supposed to be an invariance. So then note that if <clears throat> So then, if this is true, that means uh, CP is equivalent to T. Right? If CPT is true, always, then CP invariance is equivalent to T invariance. <coughs> okay. uh, All right, uh, so then how do these symmetries act? So in quantum mechanics, CPT should act on operators. Right? So physical observables, or well, things from which we make physical observables, like fields and so on, are operators, and it's on those that CP and T are supposed to act. And then this, any C numbers are usually not, uh, not modified. Usually means that we'll see that in fact for T um, they are uh, modified. And C numbers I mean not operators, so there could be things that depend on t and x, but if they are just functions and not operators, then they are not supposed to be changed. Okay? So only the operators are changed, not functions of t and x. Alright, so now let's, let's be a bit more precise and see <coughs> How C P and T act. Well, parity first. Well, parity, as I said, corresponds to changing the uh, changing the, uh, the orientation of space. And so, a good way to think about parity is by what happens when I look into a mirror. 
okay, the mirror is gives only parity in one dimension, right? But it's the point is to understand the principle. The parity itself acts on all three dimensions at once, but this is just a physical way to understand what's supposed to happen. Um, so let's say I have a momentum and the spin associated with it. So a particle with momentum and spin. Spin, um, at least classically, corresponds to what the word says, spinning. So it's something spinning, right? Um, if you want for light, you can think of uh, left and right polarization with respect to momentum. So exactly this is what I drew here, right? You can think of something, uh, specifically the combination of electric and magnetic field rotating in a plane perpendicular to the momentum. Or otherwise abstractly as something that uh, spins around the momentum. Right? <clears throat> so parity P is an uh, action identified uh, by, I mean, represented by the mirror. And if I look in the mirror, what happens? Where the momentum is inverted, right? But if I look at the direction of spin, the spin is not inverted, right? Spin still goes in the same way. You just have to think about what you see in a mirror, right? So it inverts momentum, but not S. Okay. And then I also remember what I said that in quantum mechanics CPT acts on operators, not on uh, C numbers. So an operator acts by conjugation, right? So th this is an operator. So P operator P inverse is supposed to be the transform momentum. And so since in the way we constructed things, all operators are composed of creation and annihilation operators, right? So any operator can be decomposed into these creation and annihilation operators. It suffices to define what happens on uh, these creation and annihilation operators. So let's say uh, I have the two creation and annihilation operators. Well, create, uh, annihilation operators. Creation is just a dagger of this. Um, so A for particles and B for holes, right? For antiparticles, as we said. Well, so this is the conjugated creation operator. And as I said, it's supposed to invert momentum, but not spin. So I have to write a creation operator with inverted momentum, but with the same spin. Right? And the same thing here. Uh, B has minus P. Well, the only thing is that in principle, so this is the action on the, uh, on the operator. But in principle, these creation and annihilation operators, they appear as such in fields which are not observable, right, in size. But in, uh, um, but we're only interested in what happens to something that we can observe. And any observable, any observable is uh, bilinear in fermion. Because of what I said, I cannot observe a single fermion. So that means um, if I put a phase in here, let's call it eta a and eta b, a sign. So eta a, eta b, plus minus one. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, phase, yeah. Phase such that eta a squared equal. Um, eta b squared so plus minus 1 
they have to be the same because otherwise I distinguish between the A part of the field and the B part of the field. So eta A has to be equal to eta B, at least in a square. And then uh, the sign doesn't make a difference in the bilinears. Um, all right. Uh, then, um, uh, uh, yeah, let, then let's see what happens. Um, Uh, let, let's see what happens when uh, when I act on a field, and in order to do that, I need one more piece of information. So, action on psi of x. But for that, I need one more piece of information. In psi of x, I also have the uh, UMP. Uh, UMP, sorry. Um, and well, as we saw, for the creation operator, I change p to minus p, but I don't change the energy. So let me define so p nu is equal to p zero and p. But let me define also p tilde nu as p zero minus p, right? Which would be um, after the transformation. And let's rewrite up in terms of up tilde. So up uh, us of p was equal to square root minus p sigma times psi s square root minus p sigma bar psi s. Right? <coughs> uh, and I want to rewrite this in terms of p tilde, right? Um, but then I remember that this notation is the same as the notation I did for sigma, right? I define sigma mu as 1 and sigma, and sigma tilde, or sigma bar mu, as 1 and minus sigma, right? So by this, I see that sigma dot p is the same as sigma bar dot p tilde. And uh, let's say uh, sigma bar dot p is the same as sigma dot uh, p tilde. Right? So, uh, <clears throat> so I rewrite this then as square root minus p tilde dot sigma bar psi s square root minus p tilde dot sigma psi s right and now I want to reconstruct this u but you see I flipped the order of these two things so I have to write this as the matrix 0 1 1 0 times u s of p and this matrix is in our um, in our um, vial representation is i gamma zero. So this is i gamma zero plus p. And then similarly for b s of p, this is well the same as a minus downstairs. Now the only thing is, so these are switched, but I also have a minus. If I switch them, I also have to multiply with minus. So this is minus i gamma zero. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
So with these formulas, now I can, re I can write what happens to um, what happens to psi. So I want to uh, write this. And I, I should say, uh, obviously, p squared is equal to 1, right? So when I write p minus 1, it's the same as p, right? So I can just write like this. Uh, and this is d3p, 2 pi cubes, so 3p. I mean, this depends on momentum. Well, first of all, it only depends on the absolute value, but also this is a number, so it shouldn't be changed under parity. And then here I would have AS of P, US of P, P to the I, P, X. plus B dagger S of P, V S of P, P to the minus I P X, right? <coughs> and then, and then I will put P, P minus one, so that's what I want to calculate, right? But then, well, I mean, it should be outside the integral, but as I said, P is supposed to act only on the operators, that is to say, only on the creation and, and the annihilation operators. Everything else in here is C numbers. So remember what I said, even if there are functions of X and P, or of momenta, they are still just C numbers, so should not be changed. This is very important, right? So, when I act, then I only act on the creation and annihilation operator, right? And then I can use the formulas from before. I said the result is a phase times the operator with minus p. So eta a, a s minus p. And here I get B dagger S minus P, um, eta B star, right? Dagger, which is star. Okay? But now um, I want to rewrite things in terms of P tilde, right? Um, so when I when I have this, I can remember that this is p tilde, right? Um, and then I would like to rewrite this u of p and v of p in terms of p tilde, which is what I did in here, right? Uh, oh, sorry, I should have put p tilde. Nobody corrected me. So I wrote us of p as minus i gamma 0 us of p tilde, vs of p minus i gamma 0 vs of p tilde. Okay, so this is now. And in d3p, I just, uh, yeah, I just rewrite the integral as an integral of p tilde instead of p. So d3 p tilde. 2 pi cubed, 1 over square root to be p tilde, right? <clears throat> and then eta a, now a s p tilde. Uh, and then in here I have us of p, but that I replace with i gamma 0 us of p tilde. And uh, 
the e to the i p x. Now this has to be written as e. Now I have to write it explicitly because this is a four vector. So that then this is i p tilde. I want to write it as p tilde, but then this is dot t times minus x, right? Then plus eta b star. Here I have b dagger s b tilde. Then the s of b is minus i gamma zero. Minus i gamma zero s b tilde. And then the same minus i. Now I replace p x with p tilde dot t and minus x. Sorry, not I gamma zero. Right? Which means that now if I want to calculate this, this is psi dagger i gamma zero. Um, I gamma zero. 
but um, but I um, I squared gamma zero squared is one, which means that I multiply with I when I multiply with I gamma zero, the result would be a gamma zero, right? So this is uh, it, uh, a star. Then I multiply with i gamma zero. Um, no, wait. Yeah. Multiply with i gamma zero. I get minus theta a star. point is, I want psi bar psi to have eta absolute, the sign to be eta absolute value squared. So I get eta star times eta um, but I got the transformation here was with
between this is one, this is transforms as a scalar. Okay? That is psi bar psi uh, of t of n x transformed into psi bar psi of t of minus x with no sign. And then, um, then similarly, I can now do other things like this thing. Um, so now I get the same thing, just that now I get i gamma zero, gamma, i gamma zero, gamma five, i gamma zero. Again, our, um, our operator will act on something with momentum and the spin the same way. But now think of what means time reversal. Time reversal means, yeah, 
time goes flows backwards. So momentum will change direction instead of going this way, it goes this way. But also the spin direction changes. So instead of spinning this way, it will spin now this way, right? It's going backwards. So that is to say both momentum and speed change time. Right? So P e and S change time. However, unlike P, it turns out that you cannot, so if you do again everything that I did here, you realize that you cannot uh, write this as a linear operator. Cannot be made into a linear operator. Linear operator means what we said before that uh, we act only on the things that are quantum mechanical operators but not on their C number um, coefficients. That would be a linear operator, right? Linear operator means T of alpha uh, times the state, well, T of alpha psi is alpha D psi, right? That's what linear operator means. So this I cannot do, unfortunately. The closest thing one can do is to write an antilinear operator. Right? So 
this is the actual function that we have. And, uh, well, for the uh, coefficients, that's fine, we have well, five people who just act on the coefficients. Um, and it says that we are SP. But these things are complex functions. These are coefficients of the OB complex function. So US of P complex conjugate, PS of P complex conjugate, and here P minus IPX. Right then, as before, is I want. So, you see, I, I will get a complex conjugation. So I want to rewrite uh, psi minus s in terms of psi s uh, transposed. Right. So um, this is called psi s. Psi up and psi down. Psi minus s, that is to say, psi down and psi up. Um, <clears throat> so I want to write this in terms of psi s complex function. Sigma 2 is complex. Um, but 
then I can write but, but also sigma 2 squared is uh, 1, all the sigma is squared to 1. So, um, in order to commute with this, I can write I can write uh, sigma 2 times minus sigma star and uh, you see, if, so this is an index i, so, but if i is equal to 2, then I get here, I get sigma 2 squared, which is 1. And here, um, I get sigma 2 times minus sigma 2 star, but sigma 2 star is minus sigma 2. So this is also sigma 2 squared, which is 1. So this is an equality for i equal to 2. And otherwise, uh, I get just the anti-commutation. Sigma i, sigma j is minus sigma j, sigma i, if i is different than j. So, uh, so this is true. And then, uh, um, and then, um, then what I mean by these things is something. Uh,
this object times psi s star. Switching the sign of the projection amounts to multiplication by minus s equal to and Um, all right.
sigma star is uh, sigma bar because um, oh, sorry. Uh, sigma star is uh, sigma star two is minus sigma two and sigma star i the rest of the other ones is plus sigma i. But in any case, we get the same complex conjugation in both sides. So this is truly uh, US of P complex conjugate. And this matrix here, minus I sigma 2 on the diagonal, is actually gamma 1, gamma 3. You can check that. Right. Oh, uh, 
minus s p um, can be rewritten as um, the first one would be Anyway, the point is that both A and B, when I change minus S to S, transform in the same way I change the order of the things, and I put an extra minus. Um, um, yeah, more precisely said, that I act with a matrix minus I sigma to both in the space of A's, and in the space of use, right? So then, um, so then I can rewrite in uh, both of these cases. Um, yeah, so I can rewrite this in terms of the same thing minus i sigma two times the same thing um, and um, so here is in terms of uh, minus p but now the s will be the same um, and so I can rewrite this as gamma 1, gamma 3 which is this minus i sigma 2 minus i sigma 2 acting on the same uh, field psi um, just that now uh, so this would be minus i p tilde um, Sorry, I can kill the times minus p and x, and this would be minus I can kill the times minus p and x. And then uh, the dummy variable as before is, is replaced from p to p tilde. Uh, so I get the same field phi, uh, the same field psi, but at, at minus p and x multiplied with this gamma 1, gamma 3. Alright? Um, anyway. Um, then, from this on, I can, um, I can write what happens to the bilinears. Let's say a few things 
about charge conjugation. So, as I said, charge conjugation is something that takes particles to one particle. transformation on space-time. It's not a generalized Lorentz transformation. It's a transformation that acts on fields. So classical fields, let's say. Um, but then in quantum mechanics it will act only on the operators. And the way it takes um, the way it acts is, as I said, from particles to antiparticles. And then having in mind this picture of the Dirac C that we said um, that the B was a creation operator, was um, so B was a creation operator for negative energy, but this uh, this was the same as an annihilation operator for a hole in the Dirac C. In other words, for an antiparticle, according to Dirac's physical interpretation. Yes. Um, so, since C will act on fields, and that means on operators, it means we have to define as before the action on A and B. But, um, but B is interpreted now as an annihilation operator for the antiparticle. So that means that C, A S, C minus 1, has to be B as B, right? Taking part of the antiparticle, right? And similarly for B. Okay. Uh, here in principle also could have some phase, but we didn't put it. Um, and then... Um, and then we can calculate the same way as I did for US, also ds of d star is 0 minus i sigma 2 plus i sigma 2 0 acting on the minus p sigma psi s Gamma 2 square root minus d dot sigma psi s square root minus d dot sigma bar psi s. Um, I mean the same um, the same formula, we use the same formula as before. This commutation is sigma 2, which was uh, sigma 2 minus p um, dot uh, sigma bar star. So, um, so because of that, I have that, and you notice here that this is US. So I have that US of P is gamma 2 Vs of P star, and Vs of P is gamma 2 US of P star. Okay. Then, similarly to what we did before, I can find that the transposed, the, sorry, the transformed um, fermion under charge conjugation becomes just gamma two times psi star. Now it's not an action on space-time, so that now it's uh, somewhat easier. The only action I have is this action on use, which amounts to multiplying by gamma 2 and taking the complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate also because I take A to B 
and this is multiplied by e to the i dx, but this is multiplied by e to the minus i dx. So, so exchanging a with b after uh, um, after a change of variables amounts to to just uh, taking the complex function. In other words, interchanging e to the i dx with e to the minus i dx. And the same uh, happens for you with p, it's just that I take also the complex conjugate. So I rewrite u as gamma 2 times complex conjugate of p, and then um, this, this thing I have v complex conjugate of p, and then this will multiply e to the i dx, but now it's complex conjugate as well. Um, okay, so this is the transformation for the charge conjugation, and then you can rewrite, you can calculate what happens to bilinear. So this one gives gamma two squared, which is one. Thank you. 